welcome everyone to this FERG in, in honor of Nancy Rube. Um, I've said to you all before, and I say it again now, um, Nancy is, is doing some of the most pioneering work in the field of philanthropy at this point. Um, what, what she was before she started in, uh, developing basically partnerships with other philanthropists and, non, and, 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 uh, and foundations, uh, she was uh, the president of the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation and still is. And the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation really was the host from which she decided to expand the way foundations do their business. Um, and and he, she is known for having uh, developed um, capital aggregation pilots and, uh, and which led to Blue Meridian, which is the, the big one that she's now head of as a separate entity. But, but everybody asks me, what's a capital, capital aggregation pilot? And so I'm lead off my questions to Nancy. She can take them in any order she would like, but I welcome you here. You've been here before. It's a special pleasure to welcome you, uh, Nancy. And, um, and I, I'm not exaggerating when I say you are one of the great pioneers in American philanthropy today. And, and talk a little bit about how you came to the conclusion that, that you wanted to develop a new model uh, and the, the new model being one that involves um, other partners, which most foundations do not do quite as deliberately as you've done it. And also, but partners in grant making that is very fo highly focused on impact, that is the decisions are made in ways that most foundations aspire to and claim, and claim to do, but don't usually do, such as general operating support and, uh, and, uh, and measuring, uh, uh, measuring uh, accomplishments and fine tuning grants um, and so on. So Nancy, um, uh, the floor is now yours for as long as you'd like until you get interrupted by me. So Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you back. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, and hi, everybody. Wonderful to meet you on Zoom. Um, and just want to start off by thanking Joel, uh, thanking you so much for having me here. It's always a pleasure to be part of this conversation. Um, and I just want to say that you're, as you hear about our work, um, I just want to acknowledge the incredible partnership um, that Joel has provided over many years. He's been an incredible uh, mentor to me and just incredibly grateful to you, Joel, for your amazing advice and partnership over so many years. Okay. So I'm excited to uh, be in this conversation with all of you and love to be responsive to your questions. So my understanding is you're gonna put them in the chat as we go along and we'll do our best to address them. So I could spend a long time on uh, the journey of Edna McConnell Clark Foundation. I've spent um, 20 plus years of my life working for the Clarks. And over the course of that 20 year journey, we gave birth to an investment methodology which has a major element of it that involves capital aggregation. And just to kind of fast forward to where we are today, Blue Meridian Partners is really version, I like to think of it as like 10.0 of this model that we built over many years. And it really started um, when my predecessor was hired by the board at the time that was, a and, the, and that board was a combination of Clark, Ed McConnell Clark family members, plus other outside non-family members who were kind of with a question about looking at their prior several decades of work with a question of really what, what impact are we having and how could we have more impact? And we had spent many decades really working on uh, transformation of public systems, which I think for any of us that are looking at like, how do you really solve big problems around issues around poverty, which was really at the heart of what drove the Clarks. It's really hard to imagine how you could actually solve any problems at scale without addressing systems reform. And that's really where we had started prior to my predecessor being hired. And yet it was very difficult with the limited resources that we were, that we had. At that time, we were probably um, maybe doing annual 
giving around 25 or 30 million dollars a year and we were taking on like really big problems like reforming child welfare systems and it was just we the, the there was a mismatch between the resources that we had and the problems that we were trying to solve and our board was really with a question of how could we innovate on what we had done and try to get to more impact and we went through a process of really rethinking the whole strategy and I won't go through all the details of it, but we ended up um, basically building a, a different type of investment methodology that just to kind of boil it down was about could, could we find strategies that could actually really move the needle on a major problem related to youth in America and could we become better investors at supporting the social sector leaders who are working on solving those problems by, by funding them in a better way? And we really tried to look at what were the best practices in funding, both from philanthropy, but also in the private sector. And could we blend those practices together and try to actually deliver the funding in a way that would be more transformative for for the social sector leaders that we were supporting. Um, and what over time that led to us building an, an a, a, I would say a, a different an investment methodology that was very different than what we had traditionally done in philanthropy. So we were essentially trying to find strategies that had a strong evidence base that at scale could actually really move the needle on a particular problem. And then we, tried to, as opposed to um, funding proposals, we would try to get behind the social sector leader and their board with their business plan and try to bring uh, the equivalent of growth capital to those organizations against business plans. And in, in doing that, help that leader and organization actually achieve their own performance metrics. And we did quite a bit of work in actually uh, trying to help. Today, you know, today, if you look across the social sector, you see lots of social sector leaders with great business plans. That was not actually the case in 1998 and nine when we started this. And uh, we worked very closely with an organization called the Bridgespan Group that you may have heard of that um, actually, we were their first client and, and the first business plan that we did in partnership with Bridgestone was for an organization called the Harlem Children's Zone. We kind of built this investment approach. Um, and essentially, that experience of putting these plans together was very transformational in the case of Harlem Children's Zone and many of the other organizations that we had worked with and at that time was very new um, in, in the sector. And when we, what we really believed was that if we actually helped an organization put together a great plan and they needed a large infusion of growth, the equivalent of growth capital to fund their plan, and we put in a portion of that, that they would be, have more of a jumpstart on raising the additional money that they needed to support their work. Um, and, you know, the concept being, you know, part of the, I guess part of the, the problem that we were trying to solve was the belief that part of what gets in the way of organizations being able to effectively scale what they're doing is the fact that funding doesn't flow to them in a way that is actually productive and rational. So oftentimes um, a social sector leader who's trying to implement their strategy is spending so much time fundraising for the strategy, they don't really get the best chance of actually being able to implement it. So we were trying to, part of the vision was like, let's make this super simple for social sector leaders and more transformative. And so let's bring, help bring the dollars in in a way that's bigger, more efficient against their plans. And then we really believed other funders would join in and that that would allow the social sector leader to have in hand everything that they needed to, let's say, execute against their plan over multiple years. And what we found was that actually didn't happen. 
So um, the one exception was actually the Harlem Children's Zone where um, we were able to partner with the then board to actually raise up front all the money that Jeffrey Canada needed to execute against what was his initial vision for the Harlem Children's Zone in his first business plan in 1999. And I think he would say, and we believe that it was having all the money that he needed up front to execute as opposed to having to like keep raising the money and not knowing what you have to work with was made a critical factor in their ability to like leapfrog their uh, with their growth strategy and get to the impact that they wanted in Harlem. Um, but with the exception of that experience, what we were finding was that the dollars were just like, they weren't coming in in, in any kind of a, of a rational way. And it was from that experience that we kind of gave birth to this notion of the capital aggregation strategy, which very simply, you know, we, we looked to the private sector and essentially created, tried to create a similar concept where, you know, it's not really rocket science, but could we get all funder, you know, could we get, if you, if we had a single, if we were making an investment against an, a, an organization and its business plan, could we do it in a way that would be a catalyst for other funding also coming together. Um, and over time, we did many, many versions of this. So prior to Blue Meridian Partners, we probably done um, a little over half a billion dollars in aggregating investment. And we, as Joel was saying, we did it through a lot of different kinds of piloting and experiments in doing, in doing this. But what we found was that, you know, it was a radically different way if I'm a social sector leader for me to be able to go about my work. So versus, so if let's say if I need to raise $50 million to execute against my five-year plan, I actually go out, raise all of that money, have all of my funders funding against the same plan, the same performance metrics that I'm reporting to my board on, and I can actually then go and focus on execution versus, versus having to chase the money at the same time. Nancy, just interrupt. What, what would you say to the people you solicited money from? In a sense, what did you offer them? It, 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 as I remember, a, a limited number of problems uh, and, and a methodology that said, we're gonna base, base the decisions on performance and metrics and, uh, and, and the ability to achieve consequences. Yeah, so, um, you know, essentially just, just a little bit to fast forward because I think I'll go a little bit to where we are today because I think it builds off of where we started, which was what was, attract, what, has, what was attractive in the early days with the initial pilots that we did and I think what's att still attractive today is that we built um, a capacity to actually identify, to source and diligence strategies that would, we believed at scale, actually move the needle on solving problems. And then we were able to both present the analyses of those opportunities and then the structuring of the investments, if you will, against performance metrics, where you could really see, okay, if I put my dollars in five years from now, here's what's going to be accomplished. And I think for, um, for philanthropists today, what we see is that um, folks are really searching to, to discover, to find um, want to make a difference with their dollars, but it's really hard to know, okay, where do I place my money? And we have built over a long time a research capability and a diligence and capability, which allows us to say, okay, we're picking an investment in Upstream USA because we've benchmarked across everything that exists in the sector that's related to moving the needle on making a, have an impact on unplanned pregnancy, which is one of the leading causes of poverty in the US. And this investment here for these reasons, both the market analysis that we do, plus the actual individual investment opportunity um, has, meets a set of criteria and 
potential in terms of what its scaling strategy is that actually could hit these types of metrics over um, this period of time. So we're doing the kind of the hard research and diligencing of these opportunities that I think for many philanthropists who really want to have impact but don't necessarily have the um, don't necessarily have aren't choosing or don't have the capacity to build their own staffs um, or even if they have their own staffs they want to be able to to leverage or work in areas that they might not be working in our research and, and, and analytical capability, I think is something that has been really attractive. Um, in addition, the experience of, wow, I can be part of doing something much bigger than what I could do on my own. So, you know, I, I wanna have outsized impact. I wanna get behind solving really big problems, but like there's no way I myself would do a hundred million dollar investment in something, right? But the notion that I could put in my 20 million or my 10 million or my 5 million and it's leveraged because you've got a group of other philanthropists that are all funding the same thing. And then you've got an operating entity, which is what we are basically helping manage performance and the reporting and making it super easy and streamlined for both the investor and the investee um, has been, I think, very transformative, both for the um, social sector leaders that we're investing in, but also for the philanthropists that are choosing to participate in these aggregations. Does that answer your question, Joel? Yes, it does. And I, I think it would be nice, helpful, if you'd give us some examples. I know them, you know them better than I do, of, of, the, of the projects that you have chosen, you know, uh, and, and why that, that will help people realize both the breadth, but also the commonality of the problem that you're dealing with. Yeah. So today, so just to you know, kind of go from so with Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, over you know again about 15 years, we were we worked with many many different social sector leaders that were predominantly in the youth development area, and we started to really scale up this investment methodology which was working in partnership with other philanthropists. We then decided to essentially scale up the whole investment strategy. And if we can get into this if folks are interested. We, we formed what is now Blue Meridian Partners, which we incubated at Edna McConnell Clark and is now independent, but benefits from Edna McConnell Clark Foundation's basic operating platform, if you will. And at Blue Meridian Partners, we expanded from a focus exclusively on youth development to looking at any strategies cradle to career, so pre-birth, transition to adulthood, that could move the needle on major indicators related to social and economic mobility. And what we're looking for are two things. One, we've got sort of two major components of the strategy. So one is we've got a, a portfolio of what we think of as national solutions that at scale could actually really move the needle on a major problem related to social and economic mobility. And then we also have a portfolio that is more emergent, but of places where we have partnerships in geographical regions. Um, one of them is Guilford County, North Carolina. We have partnership with the Duke Endowment. Um, I thought I saw that Mika sells. I don't know if Mika, if you're on the, if you're here, but I thought I saw you on the list anyway, but we have a wonderful partnership with the Duke Endowment. And, and we also have another partnership in Tulsa, Oklahoma with the George Kaiser Family Foundation. And we are now growing that regional strategy to other places across the country. But the, the idea is that to really make a difference around issues around social and economic mobility, you need to work very, in the end, you need a comprehensive set of programmatic strategies and policies that come together in the context of place that can actually move population level outcomes. And so in Tulsa and in Guilford County, North Carolina, there are strat comprehensive strategies that are locally led 
that also benefit from this national portfolio of best practices, if you will, and ideas, not that we're coming in and saying, hey, do it this way, we are not doing that. We are looking to the local um, leaders and strategies that we're investing in locally to build every place is different, every strategy is different, but the idea is to try to get to population level outcomes in those places and have the benefit of the set of national best practices. And so then in total, over time, our vision for Blue Meridian Partners is that it's really a go-to for philanthropists in this country that want to make a difference on issues related to social and economic mobility. And it, we're creating a, um, a community of philanthropists that are working together on these problems because they're just, they're all really big. And none of us, even the biggest philanthropists can't work on these alone, nor should they. And also philanthropy can't work on it alone without mm. partnership with government. So we're also, we, you know, through the different investments that we have, there's certainly a major public sector role. But the idea is to really be this go-to alerting community for philanthropists that are working on these issues. And then most importantly, to actually, part of the vision is to really change the imagination of the sector, particularly social sector leaders who typically do not get access to the kind of capital, to the kind of investments that we are making because there's no, um, like the average foundation grant size in America is $35,000 a year. The average length of grant is a year. Like you can't solve big problems with that kind of level of funding. And so the idea is to try to change what's possible by actually demonstrating a more efficient way to get capital flow and to try to bring that to social sector leaders. So we've got a range of different things that we have in our portfolio. Um, so for example, I, I spoke, just mentioned an organization called Upstream USA. And what they're doing is essentially really going after the problem of unplanned pregnancy in America, which is one of the leading causes of intergenerational poverty. So um, not planning a pregnancy is, if you look at all the data, um, has very negative consequences in terms of income and uh, childhood outcomes and has a big effect on intergenerational poverty. And Upstream has a really highly cost efficient and effective strategy for going into a community and working through its community health centers to basically counsel women who come into the community health center for any health need just to ask them, do you plan to get pregnant this year? Or do you plan to get pregnant? Yeah, do you plan to get pregnant now? And if the answer is no, they counsel, they provide counseling on yeah. contraception. And what's really interesting about this model is they tried it in the state of Delaware through the blanketing of the state. So like literally getting across the state to all the community health centers and actually being able to tap into public dollars just to provide the ongoing counseling and, and access to the contraception on that same day. They've been able to significantly, uh, significantly by like 30%, um, I wanna say 30 to 40% reduce the number of women who are not get who are um, planning not planning to get pregnant um, as well as they also had the additional result of reducing abortion quite significantly as well not that that was one of the goals but that's what was one of the outcomes and so now they're going they're taking this to multiple other states and once they're done in the state like once they've blanketed the state, they're, they're done and they can move on. So it's a very cost-effective strategy that at scale you could see solving the problem. Um, another example would be we have an investment in an organization called Youth Villages, which is really focused on the population of young people who age out of the foster care system and end up detached from the labor force, not completing school, um, often end up pregnant um, or in prison. 
and attached to this population, which is actually a pretty small number of people on an annual basis, something like about 40,000, attached to this 40,000 young adults are billions of dollars of costs that get connected to them because they end up in very, very serious trouble. So we would look at that as like problem to be solved and Youth Villages has a strategy that is um, highly effective at changing the outcomes, changing the trajectory for that population, um, which has funding streams attached to it. So there's a really nice way that philanthropy, our dollars can provide the growth capital for Youth Villages as it goes to different states and then their cost proposition that they can provide to the state for actually funding youth villages versus um, the, the negative outcomes that are attached with, with the population if they don't get the right supports is highly compelling. And so then our philanthropy kind of gets taken out by the public dollars coming in. So those are just two examples of kind of the, the kinds of things that are in our portfolio. So they typically are strategies that are both direct service oriented, but do have a systems changing component to it that at scale could like actually solve a problem. And then they typically have a way that we can see where our philanthropy can be catalytic, uh, not forever, but can actually serve as growth capital and can be replaced by other kinds of funding streams over time. Um, and yeah, so I could go through some other ones as well. Well, talk, I remember Boston's a nurse family partnership, one of the original um, uh, 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 organizations in your portfolio. Yes, so nurse family partnership was, um, is an organization that has both been funded through Edna McConnell Clark Foundation is actually one of the organizations we did our very early capital aggregation pilot with and is currently an investment within Blue Meridian Partners as well. And they are, they work with um, mothers who are on welfare, who get pregnant for the first time. They send a nurse into the mom's home to basically provide prenatal coaching, counseling support, and additional kinds of parenting supports until the child is age between age three and age four. And it's one of the probably the few strategies that we know of in the social sector that actually has two generational levels of proven outcomes. They've gone through multiple randomized control trials and they show really uh, powerful results both for, for both generations. So for the moms, there are um, important results related to uh, higher wages. Um, for children, there are really important results related to school readiness, uh, lack of very significant um, findings and differences in terms of the experience of ending up in child welfare, child abuse, uh, fewer hospitalizations, better health, health outcomes, etc. It's It's really a if, if literally you could get this to every single eligible mother in the US, you would significantly change the uh, dynamics around intergenerational poverty. So that's something that a uh, strategy that Edna McConnell Clark has been invested in over many, many years and now is also being funded through Blue Meridian Partners. And you know, what was in the, in the early pilots that Joel's talking about when we first did our capital aggregation strategy, what, it was one of the ones I think that was most compelling because we were really able to show how a upfront round of $50 million of which Edna McConnell Clark Foundation put in a third of that capital, you're really able to see how those dollars would be very catalytic for helping nurse family partnership, similar to what I was describing with you villages, get to different states. And then as they would get to the different states, the funded, there were actual funding streams, both local and federal funding streams for this strategy that, that if you could kind of get into the state, build the right relationships, figure out where to, what implementing agency to partner with, the dollars were there. And so 
philanthropic dollars were really used to, to spur the growth. And they had um, very significant growth during the period that we funded them in the early pilot, something like 20% growth um, and was a, would never have happened if you hadn't had this ad, the, the, the dollars essentially come in up front. So. When you, when, if I remember correctly, when you started Blue Meridian, you got a number of, of general partners and then some not so general partners to join in. And you were, t I think, tackling particular it issues dealing with, um, uh, with problems of uh, young people, uh, uh, youth. Uh, I don't remember exactly how you phrased it or how you put it. I remember attending one of the meetings of the group of philanthropists who were joining in and you, you were trying to, trying, I think, to get some focus into what the discussion would be and what they would agree to. My, my impression was that that's very unusual for a foundation or foundations basically to bring a people a group of people together uh, who have a, a, um, a, a, an intellectual commitment to doing something about some aspect of poverty and then get them to help come to grips with what they will actually do something about in the grant making. Is that, am I correct in my memory? Yes, you're correct. <laughs> Yeah. Is your question what actually got them to do things together? Is that the question? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. You know, I think that so Blue Meridian and I think all of the work when I, over the last almost 20 years now is, is kind of driven by two kind of major beliefs that come from the experience of attempting to work with social sector leaders to solve problems at scale. And the two driving beliefs are one, what I already mentioned, which is you can't solve a billion dollar problem like let's just say homelessness with $35,000 a year grants. Like there is a, a major disconnect between the problems that we wanna solve and the way we capitalize them. And then the second is that um, that philanthropists really want to solve bigger problems. The roadmaps for doing that are not readily available and readily accessible. And so what Blue Meridian is really trying to do is like bring that together. So can we actually create more access to, more and better access to transformative capital? And can we make it easier for philanthropists to actually knowing that none of us can do it alone, like make it easier to co-invest, to work together, to collaborate. And I think it was through our experience at Edna McConnell Clark, which started, so Edna McConnell Clark, you know, starts off as an endowed philanthropy in the 1960s. And I mean, let me just back up. I mean, Joel I can speak to this so much better than I can, but just from a historical perspective, Today, we're seeing this massive boom um, in, in, in wealth and in philanthropy, and it's, it's kind of like a new era, and people are trying to figure out uh, how to do it differently, and, and, and you've got lots of philanthropy that is actually not deployed, because folks don't, in my view, don't fully know what to do. In, in the era that Edna McConnell Clark kind of gave was born, which is in the, in the 1960s, it, it came after another big moment in our country's history around um, philanthropy, which is when, you know, the, the kind of the golden age of the giving of the Fords and the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and the formation of institutional philanthropies that had a particular way of I'm painting this a little bit simplistically, but the endowed philanthropic model was the lead model for philanthropy. And that's what Edna McConnell Clark was as well. And I think who it was then and then who it became by the late, um, you know, in the 1990s into, to, into the early 2000s when the wealth in this country is changing so dramatically 
they, the Clark family started to really, they had never really made the decision whether they wanted to exist in perpetuity or not, but who they were as a billion dollar endowed philanthropy in relationship to the problems that they wanted to solve, they were really asking themselves the question of like, what is it about our, our model that maybe we need to change up so that we could have more impact? They've always been, they were always driven by the question of like, what more can we do? How much more impact can we have? Um, and so, sorry for the kind of the whole context, but the, the, um, the, the decision to, they, they had gone, they, most of their work, like many, many other philanthropists was really about what do we do? What do we do with our resources? And as we started to build this new investment and methodology and we were experimenting with cap the capital aggregation strategy, it became really clear, like we could do a lot more if we could better leverage our investment and partner with others. We could actually have more impact. And they started to really like that experience. And as we started to evaluate how others were experiencing this model, we heard back from investors and our investees that it was having very important results for them. And so I think it ended up convincing the, the Clarks that, that going down the path of collaboration and actually building out this investment methodology and the aggregation strategy could be potentially beneficial to many others. And it, maybe it was a better way of, for them do it, for, certainly for them doing their philanthropy, but maybe for others also, and it could be more of a resource to, to the sector. And let me just add another dimension, which is, and the Clarks were also imagining that they didn't want to exist in perpetuity. So they were thinking about what it would look like to have a limited life. So with Blue Meridian Partners, they made, I think, initially a very important decision, which was, hey, let's do, let's see if we could actually scale up this approach in partnership with other philanthropists, but not keep control of it ourselves, not have it be um, driven by only the Clark Foundation in terms of decision making. And so when we started it up, we started it in partnership with a couple other philanthropists with the idea that the Clarks would be one vote at the table and that there, the decision-making for what we would do would be shared among a group of philanthropists. And so, I mean, I have to say, you know, in some, on some sense when we started, I had no idea this would it was, it was like we believed this was the right thing to do. It was worth a shot, but no idea if people could actually come together and make um, decisions. I think the thing that brought folks together that made it possible to make decisions is the fact that we were bringing to the table an investing team from Edna McConnell Clark that did have a pretty strong track record of having made really good investments that had performance attached to it that had results. So we were able to present, well, here are 10 things that we're looking at in early childhood, but the reason why nurse family partnership we believe is the best is for these reasons. And we have a very analytically driven approach for, for doing that. So we had this, the common, we had a track record plus the research analytics. And I think that was a way, I mean, my experience of um, the folks that have come into our partnership, they, they share a desire to see big things happen, have impact, and they're, they're, they're uh, less, they're open to, to um, a range of ideas and a range of strategies. It, it's the analytical process that I think Joel made it easier for people to make decisions together. So, and I think that's why it's very different than many of the, like people often say, oh, Blue Meridian, it's a collaborative. It's not, it's not exactly a collaborative. It's a, it, it would be more like the equivalent of a private equity firm than it would be a collaborative because we're not sitting, we don't sit around the table with our partners and say, partners, what do you think would be the best things for us to fund? What do you, what are you interested in? What do you want to fund? 
they're coming to the table because we have an investment approach that is compelling based on our track record and what we're promising in terms of performance. And so what we're doing is being super transparent about our decision-making processes, about exciting things that we're looking at in our pipeline, but we're being pretty rigorous about what we're bringing forward in terms of investment. I also think the fact that we started it with Ed the McConnell Clark Foundation capital in the mix, where we're not saying um, like, we're, we're not having, the fact that we've had the capital in the mix for our investing team has made us very disciplined about uh, say no to lots of things because we're focused on performance. And I think that that also created a dynamic, Joel, with the other partners where we had skin in the game also. So it wasn't like we're just selling to you, new partner, um, because we've got some ideas that we want to pursue. It was more like we're bringing this, the, a rigorous uh, investment approach and we also are having to you know, we too have skin in the game with it. So I think those are some of some of the things that in the beginning uh, got people excited about in investing together in this way. And, um, you know, I think just in terms of who's in the partnership, it's, we started with a with an initial pool of $650 million, we set a goal of being at Two billion by first we set a goal of being at one and a half billion, then it was two billion by 2023. We were at two billion in 2019. So just to say, like it went really, we have taken on enormous growth very quickly in terms of the satisfaction of our investors in what we've been doing. I'll just add the other thing that at the beginning I think was really important was we said to folks, the way we work is we, we, we're not a fund like you make a $50 million commitment and you put your money in, in a fund. What we call capital. So you make, you make a commitment, but it's only if we see the investment opportunities and you vote on them that we call your capital. So the capital is available and it's, but we're not, we, we do have some philanthropists that pre-fund and we can hold money for folks in a fund if they want that, but we're super flexible to meet different philanthropist needs. And I think that in the beginning, and, and we still do this, we said to our partners, if you're not satisfied with our investment approach, the analytical process that we go through, the decisions that we make and our performance at a certain point, and, you know, we, we, we created pull-up points where you could decide, I want to get out of this thing. And you could take your capital commitment back if it was unallocated. And so I think that the way we started it up by, you know, acknowledging that it was new, even though we had this track record and, but the goal was to really demonstrate the potential to get better capital flow and to do philanthropy in a more collaborative way that was performance oriented and we might fail at doing that and if we did or we might people might be dissatisfied with it and if you were we were willing to change course I think it, that was very compelling for people and we still say that to folks. Say a word about what your project is with the Duke Endowment. Yeah so with the Duke Endowment um we have, and, and this also predated Blue Meridian Partners that we started having these regional partnerships. With the Duke Endowment, we basically have a partnership where uh, they um, have gone through a process of identifying a community, it's Guilford County, where they're working on a comprehensive strategy in partnership with an entity called Get Ready Guilford. Um, Someone from Get Ready Guilford on this call, because I thought I saw somebody. Anyway, they, and they are working on a comprehensive strategy to get to population level outcomes related to uh, basically early learning indicators. Can you get all kids ready by third grade to 
you know, basically make it through school essentially. And, but starting with, with a lot of other, let me just say important outcomes um, between birth and getting to third grade. So they are working in, in partnership with a bunch of organizations locally on the ground in Guilford, as well as policymakers in the state to actually see, could you get, you know, essentially full, in a, in a whole community, get to better um, indicators that will, that are proven to make a difference in terms of mobility. They also, as part of this, have, so some of the organizations that are in our national portfolio, Nurse Family Partnership and Healthy Steps in particular, they're working with those organizations on the ground in Guilford to fully get to full scale in the context of Guilford and to actually innovate so that you could have the seamless continuum of services that go from pre-birth all the way through to completion of third grade. Now they may go beyond that to like other, many other life, life um, trajectory related indicators over time, but that's their starting place. And so we're investing in Guilford through the Duke Endowment that's investing in uh, Get Ready Guilford. So we, we're, we're not wanting to be like the national, because we're national funding, like the national funding entity like that pops into the local community. So the benefit of the Duke Endowment relationship is we're really deferring to them to be the, the catalyst, if you will, and the, the, fun, the major funding engine in that community. And they're also bringing other philanthropists to the table with them so there's a kind of a, there are different levels of the aggregation strategy. And it, it is our vision to expand that regional work significantly over the next couple of years at Blue Meridian. We do feel like in the end, uh, place is probably the most major determinant of um, social and economic outcomes for people. It's not enough to work just at, these program at the programmatic level across our national portfolio that you need both. And so um, we're really excited about that, what we're learning through the partnership with Duke, as well as the George Kaiser Family Foundation in Tulsa. How does what you're doing with the Kaiser Family Foundation differ from, if at all, from what you're doing with the Duke Endowment? Different subject focus? Well, no, the subject's very similar. So it's, it's really, it, what's different is that the places are completely different and the, the, the entities are completely different, but the, the principles are very similar. So um, what's, what's, I think really, so, so the George family, the George Kaiser Family Foundation and the Duke Endowment are like really different organizations. <laughs> so so uh, Duke is um, playing more of a, what I would consider more of a classic funding, inter funding role in the context of Guilford. They ran a whole process that got them to selecting Guilford. The intermediary entity that is doing all of the actual on the ground work is Get Ready um, Guilford, which is, you know, is th they're also passing funds through, but it's, Duke is not an operating entity like in the community in the same mm -hmm. way that it, and George, the George um, GKFF is very much of an operating entity. They're a very unusual, unusual um, funder. When I first went, uh, there's a great story of like when I first went to Tulsa to meet them and visit with them. And I'll just say they were partners with Edna McConnell Clark when Edna McConnell Clark, we actually received federal funding through the Social Innovation Fund under the Obama administration. And we met uh, GKFF during that period. When I first went there, I went on a tour and I was so confused. I went to visit um, one of their educare, this educare facility that was in Tulsa that was, I would say a, a bright spot, one of the, like one of the, one of their signature initiatives, if you will. And I went on the tour and I was so confused like who I was touring with. I thought it was the head of the, of this educare facility. And then I found out afterwards, no, this um, woman actually worked for George Kaiser. She was on the foundation team and I was just completely confused. And so they're really 
given the nature of the community and given who they are in this role, they're very, very hands-on. So they have a much closer operating relationship to the, the, the equivalent uh, strategy in Guilford in Tulsa, although there is now an intermediary organization in Tulsa that is also running this effort. But they're, um, so, but they're also working on, they also have an early childhood oriented strategy. So they're working also very similarly pre-birth, um, I forget exactly, they're probably going up a little bit higher in age, it's just school readiness, but they are, it, they're, they're similar. They're working on similar outcomes and similar, similar focus on the early end of the, of the trajectory but their strategies are quite different, even though both do have nurse family partnership and healthy step components in them. But they're just, they go about it differently. And, we, and that's great. And then when we go to other places across the country, um, we are, we do really believe that comprehensiveness matters. So Harlem Children's Zone, which is probably the, the project I've spent the most time in my own personal life on, is a full cradle to career strategy. They're probably one of the few in the country that is really truly done cradle to career all the way through. And, you know, and they are very much at a neighborhood level versus like a regional re city or regional level. And you kind of need both things. Um, but, you know, in the end, if we really want to move the needle on social and economic mobility, one does have to actually work comprehensively across cradle to career, um, but very much respect that like, that's a lot to bite off if you're starting, you know, you gotta start somewhere in Harlem Children's Zone also started on the early childhood end of the spectrum as well. So I see there's some questions in the chat. I don't know, Joel, if you wanna to go to some of those or- Well, I was, gonna, I was gonna say to you, we're gonna to go to the chat in five minutes. Okay. And so if you wanted to, um, uh, say, make a summary statement of why, of what, what you're excited, what you're most excited about, about, uh, I mean, I know you're excited about the whole plan of Bumidian, Bumidian, but is there, are there any high points that you want to underscore at this point before we shift into the questions by the audience? Well, I guess the thing that I would say is I feel like we've been really put to the test in the last you know, six months, six to seven months with, with the crisis that we have in America, with the pandemic, um, the shining of the light on the racial injustices that were already there but have been brought to the fore, the challenges to our democracy that have also come to the fore. This is a very challenging time. Um, to be doing the kind of work that we're doing in America. And I have been, uh, it's been really interesting because it's in this period that we, we found ourselves like right when COVID hit with the question of, okay, you know, what does this mean for our strategy? We had just approved, our board and partners had just approved in a year ago, so like in October, November of last year, we approved a, a next growth strategy, a next plan for Blue Meridian Partners to take us through 2023 that would have us growing from our current cap, our capital base of about two and a half billion to four billion and growing the regional strategy. And we've already put a stake in the ground around really trying to center on racial equity across everything that we were doing. This is pre, you know, George Floyd and everything that's happened this year. And so we're really kind of with this moment of what does this mean for all of our current investees? I mean, how are we gonna really support our investees to weather through this crisis? And what does it mean to take on this growth? And how do we think about this? And I would just say, I think the thing that has given me just incredible um, hope during this whole period was the way that our partners who have incredible capacity, like they're some of the largest philanthropists in the US right now, the way that they mobilized um, around COVID. We in one board meeting made a decision to go off strategy and, and 
basically put together $100 million to focus on cash relief and to focus on the emergency side of things. And to see them wanting to lean in and to move and to, and that we were able to like take leverage our research capability and figure out what to do quickly and see that kind of action happen was for me um, really seeing what I, what I think we, what, what we need in America, which is we need folks to come together and we need them to be able to solve problems together. And we can't do, none of us can do any of these things on our, 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 our own. So it really has put our partnership to the test in a big way. And we've seen our partners just really like double down on our strategy and, and, and basically saying, you know, we're going to lean into our current portfolio. We know our grantees are going to have a really tough time during this period, but we're not walking away. We're going to lean in more. We're going to do more. We're, and so anyway, so just, it's given me a lot of, um, and I've spent my life uh, working on trying to improve the practice of philanthropy in a way that can have more impact and can really make a difference for uh, the social sector leaders that are on the front lines of solving problems. And I feel heartened by what I've seen happen through our, you know, it, what we've done is, is a big thing, but it's a very small thing relative to the amount of wealth that exists that is sitting on the sidelines, meaning it's, it's sitting, not deployed. And I think that we have a really big opportunity to accelerate philanthropy, accelerate the flow of resources against things that are working, that just need better capitalization to get to scale. And it's going to be so important that we figure out how we do that in a way that is more equitable. And so I, I, I believe what gives me hope is I'm seeing that happen in our context at Blue Meridian Partners. And I want to see more of that happen and across the country. And I believe that it can. So that's well. That's very exciting, and it's necessary yeah. given the problems that we have. Right. Well, it's a great a great model for everybody else, and now we're going to give everybody else here the opportunity to uh, ask you questions, and uh, and now we're going to give everybody else here the opportunity to uh, ask you questions, and uh, Imani's going to call on the individuals who are in the chat room in the order, and then let them give their question themselves. Okay, um, Ryan Comfort had a question first. Hi, Nancy. I am just so excited to be on this call with you. Um, before <laughs> being in maternal and children's health, I was in private equity. <laughs> so the capital aggregation thing is something that really resonates. And just looking at the, um, I'm glad you mentioned the studio at Blue Meridian, which is the new thing that's kind of starting with smaller um, organizations to get them to the, be the place where they're big checkable or big bettable. Just wondering your thoughts for the future of Blue Meridian, whether there's going to be uh, a goal of being able to not take the from 30, an organization that got 35,000 to creating a space for them to be able to even absorb three to five million. Whether you guys are going to stay in the space of like, you know, we're in the 25 million plus zone, or do you see an opportunity of creating something at scale? Um, at that smaller level. So we are, when we, if you looked at our first concept paper for Blue Marine Partners, which Joel definitely had a chance to weigh in on, and it's funny to look back on it because a lot of it's held up. We always talked about two tiers of investment. So the issue of building the pipeline has been one, you know, just at Edna McConnell Clark, it's been, been on it for like many, many, many years. So there's just a gigantic gap between the, the rounds of capital that Blue Meridian Partners is doing through its national scaling portfolio. And then if you look at, I mean, we don't have a capital market like you have in the, in the, in the for-profit world. And so you've got actually a lot of, there, there's more intermediary capacity at the startup and very early stage of the market. And there's not very much that's at the pre-scaling Blue Meridian stage. And so we are through the studio, we have this, what, we, what we're calling the studio at Blue Meridian, we have started to do pilots of trying to really work with 
um, what could be the pipeline for the larger scaling investments for Blue Meridian and, and others. And we do really see a huge gap um, in the, the not startup in really early stage rounds, but the more innovation, pilot testing, trying to get to what actually is my breakthrough strategy for scaling. And mm -hmm. so we are definitely ourselves going direct through, we're doing some co working with some cohorts of organizations that are um, earlier, earlier stage that are still working on figuring out their breakthroughs on scaling. Um, and we're probably going to do more of that. We also are thinking about the market itself, meaning is there some role we could play to help catalyze th that market? We don't have to do it all ourselves, but are there other emergent intermediaries or existing intermediaries that could do a better job than us at that stage of the market? And is there some way we can work to invest in them or catalyze them or learn from them or partner with them. So I think we, we are increasingly, you know, thinking of, I just have, you know, we have questions about what is our role as a market maker and can we be help be a catalyst for that? We don't need to do everything ourselves. Yeah. Interesting. And that ties the, this bridge span had talked about the four pathways to greater giving yeah. and, you know, Blue Meridian is highlighted as one of those there. And one of their pathways was the National Community Foundation. Yeah. Has that ever been something that's been, you know, like where you thought market making, what was your reaction to when you heard that pathway? Yeah. So, I mean, in the four pathways paper, I, what I, the starting place, I, you know, I think the critical starting place is how do you scale the existing intermediary market? Because it's not, it's not, it's not robust enough at all. And so, you know, with the National Community Foundation model, which they, um, you know, spent quite a bit of time thinking through and getting feedback on, it's almost like an idea potential. I think it's an idea before it's time. So I don't think that it. It, it would, I mean, look, it could be a better, a, a better different version of the existing intermediary market, but I actually believe that you've got to, you have, let me just say, I haven't, I wasn't, as, as the folks at Bridgespan know, I wasn't the biggest fan of that idea because I feel like um, what you need, it's, it's the same for me, it's the same issue as when a funder comes in and starts to drive the market by essentially telling social sector leaders what to do because they don't have, and, and then what it does is it distorts the social sector leader from pursuing what they think needs to actually get done. So if you've got a set of intermediaries, including other community foundations that are, could do a lot more with a lot more resources, I would first start with trying to strengthen them and then I do really think there is one of the elements of the National Community Foundation concept that was there, which is this concierge concept, like it's like a, a brokering function. That I like, I think that's needed. But it's the notion of um, putting like a super foundation on top of all of the community foundations. I'm not, I'm more of a bottom up um, myself personally. I think you need more of a bottom up strategy to build, to actually build the market. So um, yeah, because I think we're in an interesting period right now where we actually need a lot of innovation. So hopefully there'll be a better version of Blue Meridian Partners that someone else will invent, right? So hope, just like, you know, we're 10, version 10.0 of Edna McConnell Clark, hopefully there'll be a 10.0 of Blue Meridian and 10, you know, five different flavors. Like you, you kind of need a lot of that. And then from that, we can build more of a market. So I'm more, a little more of the bottom up. Thank you for trailblazing. I really appreciate it. Uh, Anna McDonald has a question. Um, she says, I think what I hear you saying is that the government is necessary partner to sustain impact for scale. Um, for Blue Meridian, does that mean that the compelling programs are um, for a catalytic uh, investment include a policy component or strategy, either state or federal level? I would say the majority of the scaling strategies that we're investing in definitely have some um, government, 
funding component to it, whether that's state, local, or federal, or some combination. So most of them are not gonna fully get to scale without those public sector funding streams in the mix as well. But they're not all the same. They're all really, really different. And some of the scaling strategies also involve other philanthropy as well. So for example, we might provide, you know, part of a, a strategy might be to, you know, you're going into different regions and you, you actually have to build a muscle around local fundraising and it's a reasonable nut to crack in terms of local fundraising but you've got to like build the relationships and get that machine going and our growth capital dollars could augment that until that capacity is built so it's not a one it's not a cookie cutter everyone's everything is different depending on the nature of of the, the problem that's being solved uh, next question is from uh, Richard Smallback. Um, once foundations begin to aggregate capital and share decision making, does it make sense for them to begin thinking about organizational mergers, which might ultimately permit them to qualify as public charities, thereby avoiding private foundation status, which most foundations would prefer to avoid? Are you aware of this happening in any particular cases? Um, and let, let me put a little bit of context around that. And I, I, your answer to Ryan um, mentioned that community foundations were a big part of this picture. And I had been up until that point thinking you were talking mostly about private foundations and not community foundations. But my, my understanding of the motivation animating private foundations is uh, uh, consists of a considerable element of, of desire for control. Uh, and so um, the aggregation concept runs a little counter to that, or is at least at tension with that. Now, that's not to say that every private foundation feels the same way, but if, if the private foundations that you find uh, most amenable to the aggregation approaches are ones that are willing to share decision-making responsibility, um, the next question that seems to come up is, well, why are you a private foundation? Um, couldn't you accomplish your goals uh, as well in a, um, a setting where you could avoid private foundation status and all of its burdens? The Blue Meridian Partners is not actually a private foundation. It's a 501c3. So it's not endowed. It's not it's does it's not it's not it's a it's just a public charity for some of the reasons that you just mentioned um and and i and I, i'll just say we, the majority of our partners are not um private institutions they're individuals and families and i think that if you look at the you know, 14, I think, trillion dollars of philanthropy that is currently in DAPs right now. So that means they're not in, it's not in a private found traditional, what we would right. think of a private foundation structure. Okay. So, so basically the, the participants are not mostly private foundations. Uh... We have a few. And I would say, you know, for, for almost all of our partners, we are not the full outsource solution for, for everybody. For some, we are like a very big outsource solution for them. For the majority of them, they're doing a lot of things and Blue Meridian is one of those things. Um, and, and some of them have private foundations. But for the most part, I would say you're right that Private foundations, the mo this, this really rubs against the private foundation model. On the other hand, I think that the majority of private foundations right now in, in this country are also thinking about collaboration. And I also, and I think a lot of, there's a big move towards so many of the private foundations have so much to offer new philanthropists that are trying to figure out like, what should I do? Why should everyone have to, in, you know, reinvent the wheel and build their own private foundation? And I think that's just the question. And we know that that's not what folks want because of how much philanthropy is what I consider sitting on the sidelines, being not to fully deployed, because people really don't want to build. 
building your own staff foundation is not the choice that everybody's making. So what are other choices? And that's where I think we're going to start to see a lot of just change and innovation. Um, and I do think that, you know, I'm surprised also that there's like when, when Warren Buffett, actually the largest aggregation that exists is Warren Buffett and Bill Gates with the Gates Foundation. That is the largest, um, you know, that's an aggregation. When that happens. <laughs> you mean largest in terms of dollars, not number of people, of course. <laughs> dollars, but you know, when that happened, I thought, wow, that's going to pave the way to this becoming more normal. Right, like becoming more normal to do these kinds of collaborations and partnerships. It just, it's not normal at all yet. So unlike, you know, private equity, which also wasn't necessarily, you know, didn't exist forever, right? It got, there were, it, it, you know, it, it, a field was built around it. I, I believe that it's gonna start to look quite different in philanthropy. We're gonna start to see the emergence of more Blue Meridian-like entities. We're already seeing it. It's not completely new because the concept of the community foundation is actually very similar. So, but it's the notion that I don't, you know, the, what's how to make normal the fact that like, we don't all have to become brilliant at picking stocks to like invest our money, right? And that's not, you know, that's not the norm in philanthropy. And so that's part of the change that I think we're on the, what we're seeing is philanthropists are, are like want to be involved. They want to make decisions, but they don't necessarily, they also would love to be able to partner, be able to, for it to be easier, et cetera. Don't necessarily want to build their own staffs. Okay. Our next uh, question is going to be from Hannah Ford. Thanks, Imani. Thank no. you. Um, Nancy, this is so exciting. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I work at one of those lo long, one of those endowed foundations. I, I work at the Mellon Foundation and um, we are a national funder in arts and humanities. We're thinking a lot about place-based work and I'd love to hear more about what you started, you know, speaking to a bit and why you're investing in a regional strategy and, and what your thoughts might be around the, the role and importance of place-based work um, and how you balance that with thinking nationally at the same time. I just, I really believe in, in both. Um, I think it's been, it's, it's, the issue is how to do play. I think there's a lot to be learned about and uh, improved upon how to be a national funder doing place-based work. So there's a lot of examples of that not necessarily going particularly well. And so I think that, and then I should say the team of people that we have right now, Blue Meridian working on this are people that have spent most of their life doing place-based work, different iterations of it that haven't gone as well as we would hope that they would go. So there's just a lot of lessons. Um, and this isn't just only about philanthropy, this is in general, uh, the way in which we've invested in, you know, um, in, an, in a very um, unequitable way across the country in places. And what does it mean, I think, particularly as we imagine the recovery process that this country is going to go through. How could we do it more equitably? And I think there's going to be a really important role for philanthropy in that. Um, and so I guess my, just this is too simplistic, but I think the critical thing is like not reinventing the wheel, trying to go where there's, where folks already are doing the work and how do you get behind what's already happening and not imposing something from a national perspective onto a place, but how to get behind the work that places are already doing. And I, I'd be happy to talk with you more about it offline um, and share everything that we're working on around this. But I think it's that outsider coming in that is at the heart of the problem. And like we would never, without the relationships with Duke and Kaiser, like we would never, we would never touch it. And I think as even the way we started the work up with them, like as we're thinking about expanding this, we're, we're doing it really trying to think very differently about 
how do we get going behind what already is the momentum that exists in places and with other funders and versus thinking we can get something done ourselves from an outside perspective. That's very helpful. Thank, thank you, Nancy. I may, I may follow up. Thank you. Okay. And our next question, um, I'm going to go to Mr. Hancock. Two short questions. One, I think I know, but I want to be clear. Your uh, uh, partners, Meridian partners, when they make a capital commitment, is it irrevocable or do they have a subsequent decision to make when you suggested a deployment of their funds? How discretionary is their commitment when they make it? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, they, so right now we've got two categories of partners. We've got one group, general partners, another group, impact partners. The general partners are committing $50 million and up and the impact partners are committing $15 million and up. And at the moment, the way our governance model works is that the general partners are deciding on all of our major investment decisions. We bring our recommendations forward to them. And that's a combination of specific investments as well as what I would call asset allocations. We're gonna allocate you know, X percentage of our capital commitments to the studio strategy, but the decision-making of the individual investments goes to our management team. In another case, it could be they're deciding on a very specific investment. So they're, they're but, but they are decide, they're making decisions together as a group. We're bringing them to them. The impact partners, essentially what, when they sign up, they're basically the, the current um, partnership agreement is a third of their capital goes against anything that the general partners decide and two thirds they can place in anything of interest to them in Blue Meridian Partners. Um, I'll just say that the facts to date are that all of our impact partners are investing against everything in the portfolio. So, you know, and I would just say we're like version, you know, 2.0 of our partnership agreement at Blue Meridian Partners. And as we scale this and grow it, the, those um, terms may change because um, what we're, they're important questions about how do we continue to scale the general partner group when we, with everyone making decisions at the table. And a lot of people don't really, aren't necessarily even that interested in making the decisions after they've built more confidence in the investing team, it feels a bit pro forma. So- Once they've made a commitment, they are expected to invest in something. Either one recommended by the general partners or something else. The impact partners? If they commit a million dollars, they're expected to invest a million dollars in something. Yes, Which, we have minimum. So the minimum commitment is $15 million right. by an impact partner. And yes, it's, we, we expect them within a certain time period to commit their dollars. Yes. Well, the second question is, is a, a very exciting one to me. You're working on the frontier of philanthropy, and I think all of us are thrilled to learn more about this because of the importance of what you're doing. And you're, when you focused on comprehensiveness, I have a particular question. Uh, if you talked about your work in Tulsa and the work in Guilford, where there are existing organizations and Jeffrey Canada existed in, in Harlem, in areas where you know, or it is called to your attention, that there is a dramatic need, suppose a rural region that might encompass a, a large geographic area and hundreds of thousands of children, but you don't have any intermediaries in which you, that would have necessarily the experience or in whom you would have confidence to manage the massive investments required for comprehensive solutions. Do you ever feel drawn into, or are you willing to be drawn into the creation of organizations that could solve large scale problems where none exist? I mean, it's such an important question. We, we're wrestling with this with the place-based strategy right now, because I think 
part of the vision that we have around the place-based strategy, which, which ties um, very much to Hannah's question is just uh, the, the frustration um, that we are so massively underinvested in this in, in this country. And that frankly, after decades of people working on this, we don't have better infrastructure, better um, helping sector, a better intermediary sector that can like really go in and work with folks in all across the country and places to work on like comprehensive strategies that will move the needle on mobility, which combine both cradle to career plus the built environment plus the economic environment. So it's like there are these pieces, but it doesn't come together. And that's part of what we are looking at what, you know, what could we, and this will be, you know, hopefully in partnership with many others because we certainly don't have the answer. And so I think that the question would be then, um, I think, I think we want to figure out <laughs> how to be helpful in places that do not have the capacity. But even the places that do have the capacity haven't gotten to population level change outcomes yet. So it's like how to do both things. We're definitely thinking about, about what to do and how to structure this and, make, and how to really make the investments on the infrastructure building side. So let's say if we start off with 15 places. How do we, we have a, a component of how we're thinking about the funding being about what we're thinking is like is catalytic supports. How could you make sure you're also investing in like how do you get to the next hundred places? How do you get to the next thousand places? And what and is there how can we create more efficiencies um, in doing that? And the at so Jeff Canada, um, I think I think he'd be okay with me talking about this when he's starting to talk about it publicly, but he's for example, coming out of, he, he retired, but now he's coming out of retirement and they are creating an institute within the Harlem Children's Zone kind of incubated there that's going to be working in partnership with many others across the country to look at these questions about how could you get to other places. There was promised neighborhoods under the Obama administration and choice neighborhoods that were attempting to um, provide federal resources in to, to kind of help technical assistance and some federal resources to help, in, particularly in under, really underserved places, including many rural communities. And it was, it's kind of sad because philanthropy really hardly invested in that. So if we were going to do a repeat on that, I would be all in on the, how do we get philanthropy to come in in a much bigger way in partnership with government and really get the technical assistance more robust. So it's like the pieces are there. And I'm excited because I think it's a we have an interesting moment in this country that to maybe get it more right. So. Well, if I may say, I, the reason I think it's exciting is there's so few organizations that have your sophisticated emphasis on comprehensiveness, and there's so many areas that need that that for a, a whole lot of reasons have never built the fledgling capacities to deal with it. But they could be. I guess the point I'm trying to make is I have some specific things in mind. There are areas where the capacity could be created without great difficulty. A collaboration with lots of existing organizations, there are people who, if they thought there was an opportunity for the kind of uh, aggregated funding you're talking about, capacities could be created that would be very compelling. There's just been no particular reason for people to do that in the past because there was no chance of adequate philanthropy or adequate government funding. Okay, we have one from um, Gary Eggenbaum. Yeah, great, thanks. I'll try to be quick here. And Nancy, thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, I'm from Johnson & Johnson. Um, my question really centers on, um, in terms of achieving your mission, what role do you see for partnerships with industry, healthcare companies, healthcare providers? Um, and we'd love to follow up with you if we don't have enough time now to talk about that. <laughs> I would be very happy to follow up on that. And it's really interesting because obviously, particularly in the, in the place-based work, clearly given the crisis, everyone is focused on, um, on you know, healthcare issues. And it's an interesting moment where through what's been the forcing of telehealth, I think in particular, um, with so many of our investees like Nurse Family Partnership that I was talking about healthy steps. And then just in response to COVID, 
you know, the, the need, like you're seeing all this innovation happening in healthcare. And, and can you go beyond the crisis? And then of course we're gonna have the vaccine distribution. And so what are the opportunities for like very serious innovation there? I also, we're, I'd love to talk to you more about it because we are with the place-based work that we're involved in, it's the top issue. It's not certainly our area of expertise. So we're very much looking to, could we form partnerships and, or, and help our investees form partnerships? Um, but clearly, it's you know going to be the it's the top issue, and the you know I think what we've seen with COVID is it has shined the light on the dramatic inequities in this country, and the fact that you know some communities are being hit so much harder by this crisis than others, and how the disparities in healthcare are playing out. I mean, it is really really serious, and will be front and center in all of our place based work. So we would be very excited to explore those kinds of partnerships. I see, uh, alas, our time has elapsed. This has been really interesting. I've learned a lot. Got a, I always get a better understanding of what you're doing when we talk more about it, uh, and because I've missed a lot in the, in the course of the years. But in any event, thank you so much for making the time to do this, for coming down. You're a real pioneer, and may you go from strength to strength. Um, and we hope you'll come back again. I need the one thing I need to do that I haven't done yet is to list the speakers for the spring semester. We start off with Julie Sandorf, the head of the Charles Revson Foundation, who was responsible for building the new, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say newspaper, it isn't, it's a, it is a, um, um, uh, an online news source in New York City called thecity.com. Uh, and she, We'll talk about what she went through in getting that going. Um, then after her in February, Rebecca Rimmel, who has just stepped down from the leadership of the Two Charitable Trust after 25 years, she's coming back for another visit, talking about the high, I guess the high and the low of what she's done. Um, then on March the 3rd, we have Hubert Jolie, who has just, just stepped down as the CEO of Best Buy and who is a really smart, thoughtful guy and getting very much involved now in philanthropy and nonprofits. On the 24th of March, Rip Rapson, who's been here before, who's gonna give us another up to update on what's going on in Detroit um, uh, after the grand bargain and other things. And finally, April will feature Adam Falk, who is the president of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So those, that's the menu for the spring. We hope you'll come back and join us for some of these, all of these, to the extent that you can. And I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. And I want to thank Imani for doing a great job of moderating. And Cassie, she did a great job of, of overseeing. <laughs> so thank you all. Have a good evening and come back next time. And happy Thanksgiving too. And Nancy, again, lots of love. Thank you. <laughs>